making a musical uh, on the movie Hair on the Blonde. How much time do you have? <laughs> so uh, about, I don't know, a number of years ago, I came back from a, this is just after Christmas. I was out in California visiting my parents, and I came back home to New York, and I turned on my answering machine, and there was a message that said, Oh, uh, Joe, this is uh, Tom Jones. Uh, perhaps you've heard of me. Um, I'm working on this new musical, and I was wondering if we could meet. So um, we met, and he had been working on it with another composer, and that had not worked out for various reasons. And so we met, and we decided to try writing one song for the show to see if we um, could write together. And that song got cut eventually, but, <laughs> but we wrote many, many more songs. And uh, it's, it was a pleasure to work with him. Tom is now 94, still writing. Uh, we did, he did a number of rewrites for this version. I've never seen this particular version of the show. So it was great to see it. And um, congratulations to Jay and the entire company. <laughs> Yeah, so that's basically Tom approached me. He, his wife had ran, run to a friend of mine at a Christmas party, and his wife had said to his friend of mine, Oh, Tom's looking for a composer. Can you recommend anybody? It was David Lau. Um, and David recommended me, and that's how I got that random phone call, and now we're here. That's awesome. <laughs> and, you know, I, I realize that some people might think, Tom Jones, is that that Welsh singer who wore the tight pants? But no, Tom Jones. <laughs> He's a lyricist, and among the musicals he's worked on before, The Fantastics, I'm sure you've heard that show, and I Do, I Do, and uh, a number of others, so he's, he's, he's very well known. So, Joe, I'm curious, when you adapt, you take a film, and you try to make a musical out of it, what are some of the challenges that... Uh... Good question. Um, well, it, the biggest challenge is trying to find moments that sing. Because um, in a musical, a character kind of has to elevate out of speech and then have a reason to start singing. And so we um, were hit and miss with that for a while, but um, I feel like we're closer now. And um, yeah, it's just finding those moments that, that can elevate the story, elevate the drama to a point where we feel that the song is the natural outcome of what the scene is going for. And just, yeah, just working, working, working. It, it, because there's been a number of permutations, right? Yeah. Versions of the show. It's you've been working on it for almost 20 years. Off and on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times when they talk about making a musical out of a movie, they want to maybe add something new to it, and not just do the film. Literally, what do you think is different from this musical version, uh, or something that's been added from from the film? The biggest difference for me, and I think for Tom is that uh, the film, which is a great film, was written by a man named Colin Higgins, who was quite a young man when he wrote the film. And so for a young guy who's in his early 20s, writing about a woman who's 80, and just decides randomly, to, oh, I've lived it long enough, I'm just gonna end my life. And Tom, being coming from the other side of it, thought, no, that's not right, she needs a reason to say, I'm going to end my life. And he came up with the idea that She's actually not doing well, and she wants to leave something, and she keeps looking for some way to impart her wisdom, and she finds that in Harold, and seeing this young man who, yeah, Maude is a woman who's in love with life, and Harold is a young man who's in love with death, in a way. And so she basically kind of gives him the spirit to, to forge ahead and to live a better life. But she couldn't, conceive of ending her own life, you know, as sick as she is, without passing that torch to somebody. And when she meets Harold, she just thinks, that's the guy. Yeah, yeah. We, we were talking about the cast, how the, the script itself gives a little bit more backstory, certainly about Maude. In the film, you just see her raising her arm, and you see there's a number tattoo on there, and it's never discussed. And in the musical, of course, we, we, we learn more about her, how she lost her family, how she's lost everything. And, uh, and then she probably was part of uh, the crystal map when she talks about the, uh, the shattering glass. Uh, and I was curious when you're writing for the different characters, a song for Maude or a song for Harold, 
is there a certain kind of musical motif or something that, uh, that, that, that goes with each character? Um, in this case, it was more just a mood, trying to establish, like, in Harold's opening song, it's more of a kind of an early 70s pop feel. Um, in Maude's song that she sings, when she talks about the shattering glass, it's sort of a homage to sort of an old, more Eastern European feel of, of a minor key waltz. Um, so we tried to be, find sort of a, a specific language. The song that the mother sings, uh, when she's filling out the survey, we try to make that a little twee at the beginning, you know, so it's a little Mozartian at the beginning, because she's a little bit uptight. And so yeah, we're trying to find some ways to have everyone have their own personality and music. Sure. And Chandra sure had fun with that, <laughs> the motif at the beginning. So what are the next plans for Harold and Maude? I, uh, what has been really exciting for us is they were working on you know, uh, workshop and, and refining the musical, and it was it was exciting to get the script and the final score the weekend before auditions, and uh, last week to to get a copy of the Bowles music because that doesn't usually happen. Usually, you know, you get music that's been published and licensed by the company well in advance. Uh, so what, what do you hope the next steps? Uh, I think Tom and I still want to do a few little tweaks and rewrites and then hopefully release it to other theaters to do at their leisure. Uh, this is the first time a community theater has ever done the show. And it's the first time there's been a production in the United States. Where Tom and I, I mean, we have been there, but it's the first time it's been done here where Tom and I haven't been there to be, usually we're there, we're rewriting and we're making changes. And, um, so it was nice to sort of not have to go through all that work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to sit back and, and see it. And I just want to, uh, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, I saw this on a website for Tom Jones and his uh, former uh, composing partner who passed away, Harvey Schmidt. And they listed the show, Harold and Lawn, and it said on the website, you can contact if you want any information on any of the shows. And I contacted the website and I said, might this show ever be available for community theater to do? And I, I didn't expect to hear anything back. And I got an email later that week from Dan Shaheen, who is the agent of- No, but we're sort of, he helps Tom with a lot of- he, he works with Tom Jones and he said, this is possible. And uh, we took it to Village Players, and Village Players said, "Yeah, let's let maybe let's see if we could be we, if we could do this." And of course, we didn't know whether we had the rights. The licensing company didn't have materials printed up, but but it all worked out. And it's so exciting to be you know to be the first community theater group to be able to do this show. So. Questions for Joe. Yes. Um, there's always the big question when you have a composer, a book writer, a lyricist. What comes first? Do they work with each other? Is there something that you play that you feel that then Tom has to match, or how does it come about? All of the above. So, <laughs> Good. <laughs> sometimes it's often it's a lyric that comes first. Uh, occasionally it's been a tune that has come first. Sometimes it's been I've written a short part of a tune and we'll give it to Tom and he'll set that and then come up with an idea for the middle section and I'll set that. Um, but and every song has a lot of discussion, hours and hours of talking about why this song, why there, what do we want to accomplish, what kind of style. Um, so it's a lot of conversation, but it's, it's worked back and forth. I would say probably this show, roughly, you know, 60% lyrics first and 40% music first. Um, but Tom's great. He's 94 years old and he's just a very flexible collaborator to work with. And some collaborators will be like, oh no, I have to do the lyrics first. And Tom is open to finding any avenue to find the best version of the song that we can find. Awesome. Thank you. It's awesome. And, and you mentioned to me, I said, are you in the same room when you're writing a song? And you said you kind of like to talk it off, but you like to kind of go on, on your own. Yeah. And, I, and Joe also shared with me that, he, that he's been writing songs since you were. Five or six years old? Yeah. <laughs> now, he's, now he's 20 years old. Right? <laughs> 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 Other questions for Joe? 
Who's your favorite song in the show to write? Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, I never thought about that. Um, it was fun to write. Wow. So that title song, Harold and Maude, uh, we had an earlier version of the song, and it just never quite worked the way we wanted it to. And Tom said, go off and write a tune and see if I can set it. So that's what we did for that song. And that was fun to sort of have, to be in the driver's seat completely, to write that tune and have Tom do the hard work of putting words to it. <laughs> uh, but I also, I think Tom and I both have an affection for uh, the real thing, which is the song, These Things With The Gun. And Tom described it as, and it's, it's helped me find my way to the music. He described it as, it's a love song but it's a love song to death for this kid who's just a little messed up at the time. And, but that's how he sincerely feels, and so that he's, his emotions are really that love that is just slightly misguided. And the arc of the show for us is that how Maude takes that feeling and sort of redirects it towards a more human and healthier way to direct that love. It, you know, it's, it's interesting, Curtis, you'll remember this when we first started rehearsing and learning songs, a lot of the people in the cast said, I keep humming that song, the real thing. You know, thinking about that tune, I know when I was making leads, that the song I was thinking about in the fall when we, we first started. Uh, Brian? Yeah, is there anything you saw in tonight's performance that gave you an idea or an inspiration to change, add, or delete to your final production? Yes. <laughs> because it's the first time, the last time we did the reading, I actually played for it. So um, it was the first time in a long time I've been able to sit back and take in the show without having to actively play it. And yeah, there were three little spots of that, oh, maybe we could change that or clarify that or trim that. Um, I'm, I'm eager to get back to my hotel room and write them down. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but, but overall, I, I felt I felt good. Curtis. Hey, Curtis. Curtis, the music director, Curtis Hill. I want to piggyback off changing because you know the original score is all killed because I changed the music and had an instrument. What do you think? I, I love hearing it. I love hearing the instruments. <laughs> uh, it, it's been done with we had with the first production we had we had ten people in the orchestra and then we had because of budget that makes like the third or fourth production we had five people. Um, so it's. Uh, it was always intended to have instruments, but it's always great to hear what you, what you added there. So thank you oh, very much. Thank you. Keep in mind, keep I love your show. <laughs> Any, anything else? Oh, uh, way in the back? Yeah. What was your first experience hearing your music ever being performed on stage? And do you remember what it felt like? Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about what the first thing would have been. Um, on stage at a show, would have been, there was a show I wrote before this called Was, and uh, oh. there was a production of it. Um, the first production of it was in Dayton, Ohio, actually. And it was surreal. <laughs> but, because you, you, you know you wrote it, but it's like if you, it's the same thing as if you've written a, an important email or letter to somebody, at that moment, you're completely in it. But two months later, if somebody said, can you quote that letter? You'd be like, oh, I don't remember. So it's, you remember parts of it, but it's, it's always interesting to have written something and sit back and hear it without actively playing it. Um, so yeah, it was, it was uh, it's mostly a pleasant experience, and sometimes uh, in hearing some of my stuff in other situations, I've been like, oh, I need to change that. <laughs> but mostly. And uh, I know you have a couple other musicals that you've been working on, right? And uh, and in addition to writing musicals and doing concerts, you uh, just, if some of you might have seen, uh, Patty LuPone did a cabaret show, 54 Below, and it was streamed live on New Year's Day, and Joe's the music director for her, for her shows, among many other people. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Joe. Is there an intended fabulous production? Um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah, we're in talks about that right now, so I hope we can. Thank you.
we were talking we were talking about how long it takes a show to just stay to get to Broadway nowadays raising money in workshops it's not you know you write something in six months and it goes up but um, well we want to thank everybody for being here tonight and again thank Joe so much for <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for coming tonight.